All right, our next speaker is Ambrose Wonkum from the University of Cape Town. He's a specialist in the clinical application of genetic variation. He's going to speak with us about some of his experience working in Southern Africa. Sambonani. Usually, if I say that in South Africa, people will say Yebo. Um, Sambonani? Yebo. Okay, that good evening in Zulu. So it's really a privilege to be here, uh, to be at this audience, and uh, to maybe take the opportunity to show a little bit how genomic medicine application in, Afri in Africa um, needs some attention and how uh, research in that specific area of implementation of genetics in Africa specifically may benefit the rest of the world. Um, I would like to thank Dr. Nelson to have invited us in this panel and also all my colleagues and collaborators here and uh, to have given us uh, as African and African clinician this platform to expose uh, some of what we, are, we have been doing uh, these days. Let's start uh, with the problem. Uh, Africa represents 15% of the world population, about 5% of uh, uh, GDP only, and uh, we have only 1.5% of uh, investment in research and development. If you plot research and innovation from Africa on the map, Africa disappears, as you can see on this map. There is a little section of Africa down there. I would like to believe that is because of people like Himla and I um, that may produce some of the research that can be visible on the market. The second issue that we have in terms of genetic medicine implementation is knowledge, and knowledge at all the level of uh, medical education. We reported this 10 years ago. We replicated the very same study in the context of the University of Cape Town, and we have similar uh, trend where medical students, doctors, uh, feel that they are not properly educated in uh, genetics and uh, in uh, genetic medicine generally. I, I guess I've seen earlier that it's also the same trend in the US here, so I'm not very worried about this. Uh, the second is the public understanding of genetics. This is part of a very, very big family tree uh, with, uh, that uh, is related to a condition called Fragile X Syndrome in a village in Western Cameroon. We saw this family in one of our clinical consultation, and in this family there is at least 200 people affected with uh, uh, Fragile X Syndrome, and they are all descendants of a single individual that was Chief K. Chief K was a normal transmitting male. But the legend in this specific village is that Chief K condemned to death someone that was mentally retarded. And because the person died, say to Chief K, oh, your son would be mad like me, until we were able to show that this was, in fact, Fragile X. I think I have a team now in that specific village doing some uh, social and ethnical and neurological study, and we will also take out the opportunity to have some biological sample for this uh, family. Another issue in genetic medicine practice in Africa, uh, as you can see, many people uh, perform genetic research in Africa, but uh, not many people also uh, seek to complete their obligation to build capacity locally. Uh, 20 years after the completion of Human Genome Project in this specific setting, in the available literature that involve human DNA in this specific setting, only 14% of Cameroonian institution was mentioned on the papers, and only 28% of Cameroonian author was mentioned on the paper. Another issue is that when geneticists arrive in Africa to work, many people are interested in genetic variation and uh, genetic, uh, population genetics and very little interest of disease genetics like sickle cell anemia or thalassemia. As you can see on this map, 50% of paper that come out of Africa are on population genetics. And uh, this is not specific to Africa, but globally there is a failing to, uh, in diversity in terms of available data 
on a genome-wide association study. But fortunately, these have been changing in the past 10 years due to major initiative. One of it is the H3 Africa Consortium. And the inventor of, of this concept is Charles Rotimi sitting there. And one of the big supporters is Francis Collins in this room. And these have made a major change over the past few years. And uh, if we were to do the very same study now, things would have changed much because most Africa scientists now are invested uh, in their time in, in searching for genetic conditions that matter for the continent and are more and more present on the literature. I would like to tell story, three story, uh, to illustrate how genomic medicine practice in Africa is important and how this can impact the practice over the world. And the first story, I will call it the tragedy of the common. I should have said the commons uh, from the economical theory and the book that were published a couple of centuries in the US, in the, in the UK, and starting with sickle cell disease. We have to start with sickle cell disease because it's the first molecular disease and it's the disease from which many, many uh, very, very respectable geneticists in the room started their career. It's also uh, it, the disease probably that shaped our own career and for some strange reason, we have been trained uh, under the mentorship of Professor Antonarakis in the room, thank you very much, and himself was trained by Kazazian, and Kazazian came from Pauline lineage, and all of which are very strong people that establish some of the bases that we know now on this specific condition. Uh, this condition appeared in human history as per Charles Rotimi's study 7,000 years ago, get fixed in the human population 5,000 years ago, they become particularly prevalent in areas of the world where malaria have been prevalent because of a very strong natural uh, selection. Just the history of selection and uh, sickle mutation still need to be investigated. How our genome have evolved over the past 5,000 years. Not very long time ago, I was trying, I was giving a similar talk at Penn University, and I was trying to say that convince people that a Bantu guy from Yaoundé is closer to an Italian guy than closer to a Bantu Kosa in South Africa. And the reason is very simple. In a Kosa from South Africa, there is no sickle cell disease because they migrated 2,000 years ago or 2,000 and a half, and they're not, they don't need a mutation anymore. While in an Italian guy, you still have sickle cell disease if the guy is living near the Mediterranean. So from the genetic point of view, a Bantu uh, person from Yaoundé is closer to an Italian even though anthropologically and culturally there might be difference. There is a clear dissociation between our genome evolving, our anthropology and our culture, so there's still a lot to learn about it just taking this specific condition. Uh, sickle cell disease mutation uh, led to the change of the structure of hemoglobin, that is the protein that made of 70% of the content of red blood cell, and this uh, hemoglobin becomes sticky become very rigid, and that leads to the destruction of red blood cell and also to the obstruction of vessels, and that are the basis of the complication of sickle cell disease that leads to anemia and organ damage. To the modern medicine, the condition have been described for the very first time about 100 years ago here in the United States uh, from a student that was from the Caribbean. And uh, since 100 years ago, there is only one medication that is available and efficient for this condition, which is hydroxyurea. The mortality have uh, rate of uh, this condition have dropped drastically in children because of hydroxyurea and antibiotic prophylaxis. And but in adults, even here, the best care in the United States, the mortality have remained constant over the past 30 years. And the reason being that chronic complication, cardiovascular complication, uh, remain the main killer in adult. I would like to believe that if we uh, focus on this chronic complication in sickle cell disease, that may help us shed the light on a chronic cardiovascular condition in a general population. The reason being that many of these conditions, whether they are kidney dysfunction, whether they are stroke, whether they are pulmonary function, are under genetic control. I'll come to that a little bit later. How can genetic help sickle cell disease, at least in clinical practice? The way we see this is that genetic can help at least at three levels. The first is uh, prevention, 
primary prevention that can extend to early detection, like genetic diagnostic before birth, introduced to the world by Neil Kazazian about 40 years ago. But we introduced this to, in Cameroon only about 10 years ago. And on this picture is the very first baby that was born after genetic diagnostic before birth for sickle cell disease in Cameroon. But we quickly realized that we couldn't follow that direction, even though we are still doing the practice because of all the ethical consideration around it and all the ethical conflict that was around the practice. We don't have time to get into that, but that can make sense, make a whole day uh, lecture. Uh, the second area where uh, genetic can help sickle cell disease is in secondary prevention. Despite being a monogenic disease, this condition is also subjected to many genetic variations that, mo that modify completely the complication and also the severity of the condition even in the same family. For example, when it comes to kidney dysfunction and sickle cell disease, this is clearly modified by at least three genes. The inheritance of alpha thalassemia, uh, ApoL1, once again another evolution of our genome through the selective pressure of trypanosome, and also a variation in one specific gene that influences hemolysis, that is HMOX1, uh, all of which contribute to uh, the predisposition of clinical complication in patients with sickle cell disease. Stroke is also one of the major complications, and very early research uh, many years ago have shown that it's possible to use a Bayesian model to predict occurrence of stroke uh, in sickle cell disease. And very recently, using transcriptomic data, it was possible to classify patients according to a degree of severity and susceptibility uh, to, to death. So we believe that if we combine uh, using, use the brutal force of new generation sequencing, if we combine it with transcriptomic data, maybe adding metagenomic data, we should be able to have a genetic risk model for this condition that may allow us at birth to know which of the patient will be more sicker so that we can have more aggressive treatment. Before we arrive to that, sickle cell disease might also be helped by genetics for specific therapy. Let's come back again to modifiers. 30 years ago, it was shown that if you have increased level of fetal hemoglobin and with sickle cell disease, you live more longer. And fetal hemoglobin is subjected to genetic modifiers, and these genetic modifiers ex will explain up to 20 to 50% variation of fetal hemoglobin. And these genetic modifiers are also subjected to therapeutic manipulation, a specific this gene called BCL11. If you delete the two copy in a mice that have sickle cell disease, the mice will be cured for sickle cell disease because he will start produce a high level of fetal hemoglobin. And of course, this knowledge have helped now refining new therapeutic hopes uh, using uh, gene editing for sickle cell disease. And last year, for the very first time, a patient was cured using gene therapy in sickle cell disease. So we are probably facing the most common monogenic disease of humankind, but we also have the tool today if you want to, if you want to engage Africa uh, in genomic medicine to help the patient, the 350 newborn that are born every single year in Africa. My second story, I call it the tragedy of the rare, and the case study here will be disorder of sex development. Many years ago, when I tried to establish myself as a geneticist in Cameroon, we started a program that allow us to see many children that have genetic uh, disorder of sex development and urogenital malformation because we were facing our incapacity to diagnose them properly and also to provide them appropriate treatment, we had to call back some of our friends and colleagues from Geneva and France to establish this program that is still there today. And in the first three years, we saw nearly 300 patients, and we were able to classify those patients using specific uh, genetic testing and also to provide some treatment to some of the patients to map the nature of mutation for some, con for some of the condition, like this condition called congenital adrenal hyperplasia that make a female baby being virilized. And we were able also to provide some uh, solution to some uh, rare and complex condition, like this condition called ovotesticular GSD. In this specific uh, young boy, he was self-identified legally, socially, 
psychologically as a boy, but he had on one side an ovary, on the other side a testis. At the time we saw him, uh, he had some breast development and he was extremely uncomfortable in his life and every single morning he will have to attach the breast so that his peer will not notice that he has some breast development. And to provide appropriate treatment, this requires us to have an appropriate diagnostic genetically and also uh, in terms of his morphology and also in terms of possible therapeutic option that will be comfortable for him and also for his parents. This was the typical case where even in a very low resources places, you still need genetics to help your patient. It was also a typical example that beauty and the beast can live together, genetic and surgery. Genetics is beauty, of course. And the last history I would like to tell today is, I call it unknown, is the exome database. And the case study here will be the genetic of hearing impairment. Hearing impairment is very common, six times, seven times more common at birth in Africa than in the United States, one in a thousand in here, in my country, six in a thousand and at birth. We know that 50% of children that are born deaf, 50% uh, of them will be due to a specific genetic cause. And the majority of these children will have a non-syndromic hearing impairment. That means hearing impairment without anything else. If I was working in Geneva in a Stiliano's lab, 50% of the children that we will see that are from European or Asian ancestry will be explained by only one gene, or at least a couple of them, connecting 26 gene. And when we started this study in Africa, we tested in many, at least four different countries, and we realized that this mutation in this will explain exactly 0% amongst people of African ancestry. And the only reason why it's very common in European and Asian because the mutation evolved after out of Africa and become prevalent because of a founder effect as shown on these two uh, uh, pictures here. The next step was to know if we use panel sequencing with the non-gene of hearing impairment, what is the pickup rate in population of African ancestry? It's very low, 4% in population from South Africa, black South Africans, and Nigerian, compared to the higher end of 60% in the Middle Eastern population. If you perform the very same panel on, uh, in here in the United States, the pickup rate will be lowest amongst African American, 26%, compared to about 70% of uh, American from uh, Middle Eastern ancestry. So our argument was that if we want to discover novel genes of hearing impairment, we have to do it in Africa, and we know there is at least 100, 200, 300 genes that still need to be discovered. And to prove this concept, we took a couple of family that was negative for panel sequencing, and we use whole exome sequencing for one family that have two affected uh, person, one daughter and one a son, and we discover this mutation in this novel gene that we found in an independent family from the same country, and this gene is responsible for the function of a stereocyl in the inner ear, and uh, this mutation is predicted to destabilize uh, the protein and to make the protein shorter. And uh, functional analysis uh, also show that this mutation leads to the reduction of the production of this specific protein and also completely disturb the localization of the protein. And when we were about to prepare uh, for more functional study, we quickly found Jackson Lab, and they say, in fact, we have a mice model for that specific, that is knockout for that specific gene, and that mice is completely deaf. So, and uh, we believe that uh, using uh, these preliminary data, uh, probably the next frontier of genetic research of hearing impairment should be in Africa, and probably this might be valid for many uh, monogenic uh, condition. Why do we need to do this? We need to do this because, first of all, we still need to provide a proper diagnostic for our patient, and that would be relevant for Africa. It would be relevant for diaspora of African population elsewhere. And having exome data from this monogenic condition will also allow us 
to improve the representativity of exome data. The, my previous colleague said that we are all African, and that, but if you want to understand our full genome, you need to understand the genome of African population. And if you look at this chart on exact database, it's less than 10% of African exome, and these 10%, in fact, are African-American mostly, not African-based in Africa. So monogenic condition study using exome or genome will allow us to improve this representativity. This is not charity. It's not just to make Africa feel good. This is important for global understanding on human genome. This is a typical example why we should include more African data in the literature. Maybe to test uh, this, in this specific condition called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, there was one specific mutation that had been delivered to many patients for a very long time until someone found that that specific mutation was 30% amongst African American. So it was just a polymorphism. It wasn't at all a mutation per se. And a simulation shows that even the inclusion of a small proportion of exome data in the database from African population who have prevented to have this specific mistake. So we have called our research center Genetic Medicine for African Population. And now we are busy in at least four or five different projects that try to uh, maybe put as a content on the story that I just tell now and specifically in one of the projects called IFGINRA, that we have called IFGINRA, Incidental Individual Genetic Finding in African Population, by the time we get used to exome or genome in our population, we will have to question what do we do with the result? What do we do? Do we have to investigate also other genes that are prevalent or not? Or do we have to in investigate actionable genes or not? And what do we have to do with it? And we have been able to do this job because first of all, people that inspire us, uh, starting with people that train us. Thank you, Stilos, again. Uh, thank you, people like Chas Rotimi, that really provide strong leadership in African uh, genomic uh, research in Africa. And we have a very strong support up to now from the NIH, and also recently from the Wellcome Trust, and also a very strong support from all the patient and patient population and patient support group and our students that have contributed uh, to the power of the work we have shown here today. I would like to thank you for your kind attention. Uh, Asante Sana. Yeah, we have time for some questions. It seems like I was very clear, so I would just take a seat. <laughs>